Hello, uh, my name is Jun Lee. Uh, I know most of you know me, but I know sometimes I run into new people. So uh, I happen to be uh, the pastor who directs the student ministry, so college students on down to our babies, uh, and, um, and I love what I do. Uh, I stand before you here today not because I'm like so spiritually qualified, but one of the things that the Lord has been really pressing upon my heart is the foundation of grace. You know, in the scriptures, it tells us, right, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And then John 1.14, it continues on that grace upon grace or grace on top of grace have been lavished upon us. And, I, it, you know, when that bears upon you, like, and I hope I'm learning the lesson, but like, you really grow in humility and gratitude. Like, it's just a natural thing. And I can tell you, like, I mean, totally, like, I only stand here upon grace, not because I'm better one iota than anybody. Like, I feel really humbled even to be here. It's really by His grace. And in Galatians 3, Apostle Paul, he had strong words for the Galatian church because there were these people who were called the Judaizers, and they really wanted to make sure that everybody got circumcised. And I don't believe they did this out of evil intent because really, like, that was the mark of the people of God, the Jewish people back in the day. So they may have done it with good intention, but in reality, Apostle Paul was like, what has come of you? He said, hey, what you have started with grace, are you going to finish with the works of the flesh? He said, does, does God do miracles among you because you have believed in his word or by the works of the law? And so what is really important for us, especially as we become adults, is for us to be excellent in the most basic, foundational things that we could teach any Sunday school kid, right? I always describe it like this to our college students. Like the best tennis players in the world are not the ones, because all of them seem to know how to do trick shots between their legs, but like you only pull that out like once in a blue moon. Like the best tennis players in the world happen to have the best forehands, the best backhands, the best serves in the world. And for us, it's really important for us to really make sure that we're really childlike and best at listening and being excellent at the most foundational things in our lives. And one of the things that we really have to come back into is that the Lord says, right, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I used to meditate upon that, and I went, why faith, right? You said there are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love, and greatest of us is love. And again, I'm not discounting that because it's, that's embedded in the greatest commandment, right? To love the Lord and to love others. But I started to wonder, what is it about faith that really makes us be able to please God? And then it started to make sense to me that every aspect of our relationship with God really is on this foundation of faith. So not only do we come to believe in Jesus, right? In faith, we come to the faith, come to the knowledge of God and walk with Him. But like every part, just like God has been pressing grace upon grace and helping me see that in the reality of our lives. Like, you know, we, it's like a message that we all know, but like it's been pressing upon me like, Really, like I was dead in my sins and I was condemned. I was a child of wrath. But as it says in his word, because of his great love for us and God who is rich in mercy, he has given us life and seated us in the heavenly realms. And like this reality, like all of us in church, we're like, we know it in our heads, but like, it's like, wow, I really deserve to be condemned for all of eternity. But he is Christ, who has seated me in the heavenly realms, given us, give me every spiritual blessing in Christ. And it says there is a promised inheritance, and he guarantees that by the Holy Spirit he has given me. And that gratitude, that amazing reality, stop becoming mere words that you get tired of hearing, but becomes living and active as God's word is supposed to be, as it declares, and then it starts to do a work in you. 
And the same thing happens when faith is not just something we believe in the moment, but like faith and faith and faith and faith, in so much so that in the scriptures it says that we shall live, we shall walk by faith and not by sight. And I know we have all heard this, but I want to ask us, is that really the life that we are living in and for us to really reflect up upon that for our lives? You know, when Pastor Shine asked me to preach, I, I felt honored. Uh, well, I mean, it's always an honor, uh, um, uh, a terrifying honor uh, to speak the Word of God and to come on this podium. But I was also honored because I remember him a month ago saying, uh, yeah, I'm going to give chances for our young pastors to preach. I didn't think I would be part of that rotation. So I'm 41, and I kind of feel it these days. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I received. Thank you for the encouragement, Pastor Shine. And uh, I'm going to date myself here, but some of you guys might remember the movie The Sixth Sense, right? Starring Bruce Willis and Haley Joel Osment. I think it came out around 2000, 2001. And... Basically, the sixth sense of this kid, okay, it's okay, I can spoil it for you because you're all on Lifelong Media Fest, right? So, um, he is able to see dead people. That's basically the premise of the movie, so he's scared, okay? And so, he has a sixth sense. So, when we think of the five senses, right, all of it is in the natural realm. So, we're able to see, right, hear, uh, smell, taste, touch, but I sometimes think, because, you know, being a Korean American, I know some of us are not, and in, in, I don't diminish that at all, but, like, to be in America, and especially for a Korean American, it's not, like, that special to be a Christian, right? Like, like, it's not, like, that unusual, but then, that's why we need to keep being in the scriptures, because when I read the word, I'm like, oh my gosh, right? This is not like, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian like everybody else. In the scriptures, it says that I've literally gone from death to life, from darkness into light, right? That I was blind, but now I can see. So it started to make me wonder, like, okay, the scripture says that I'm a totally new creation. And sometimes it really takes faith to believe that, right? Because I look the same. Even after I became Christian, like, sometimes I struggle with the same things, right? like pornography or things like that, and then like, or, 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 or deceit, and then I see myself stripping down on that, that I have to really cling to his word and be like, I am a new creation. And the scriptures tell us very clearly that God lives inside of me, the spirit of God. So does he live in me just so you and I can try just a little bit harder? Or does he live in me because he has called me to live a life of a completely new dimension that people who do not know Christ cannot even dream of living. I think sometimes people in the church get so familiar with church life that we make it into like about mere morals. That's how the people of the world think of religion normally, right? Like they teach you good stuff. And I, I was having a talk with some of our children's pastors. And, you know, in the children's curriculum, a lot of them, they teach you, like, good stuff, right? To forgive, to do the, these things and whatnot. And, and they're all excellent. They're all needed. I'm not denouncing any of that. But it's hard to find a curriculum that I like because there's really very few curriculum that talk about having faith and living that out. Because we're supposed to live by faith, not by sight. Right? So then it's that faith undergirds every action. So it's, it's actually hard to really try to tell people and convince people to do all these moral things. It's really, it's like, oh man, it's tiring. Unless there's like a faith that undergirds that action. So then one of the things that God has learned, taught me over the years is to forgive. One of the best advices I received was to forgive someone immediately on the spot. And I've gotten much better at it. So I would say maybe 80 to 90% of the time I can do it, but then there's that 10 to 20% when I can't, right? Every time the response is always the same. I go to prayer and I wrestle because I know I must forgive. Because again, 
helping, really believing God's word at face value. So then in the Lord's Prayer, I wish it was included because I think so many of us need it, right? It ends with, you know, like, you know, in all glory. But Jesus says, for if you do not forgive other people their sins, my Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. I thought, that's kind of a big deal. I know we're saved by the blood of Christ, not by our works. I don't know exactly how that works. My theology is not that great. But I just, I just got to take that word at face value. It's not an option. I don't forgive them because they're so lovely. They're so deserving. I just do it because I need to for me. And then like the parable of the unforgiving servant, right? Who literally in today's terms is forgiven of billions of dollars by the king. Then he's on his way back home and he sees a guy who owes him $10,000. When people wrong you $10,000 or it feels like a lot. And then he has him thrown in prison. Of course, he gets thrown in prison. And then Jesus concludes, that's exactly how your father will treat you. And it took me a while to really believe that I have been forgiven of billions of dollars. And when people wrong me, it's 10000 But I believe. And I must do. So faith undergirds our actions. Like everything. So much so that in the scriptures, right? It tells us that everything that does not come from faith is sin. And again, let's not let it go in one year out the other, but really think about that and receive that. <laughs> and by the way, when I talk about living in faith, yes, I am talking about the supernatural, signs and wonders. We believe that and we receive that, but it's not just about that, but even in everyday life, you know, I was struck by King David in this past week's reading of Bible time, where this guy named Shimei, right, from Saul's family, he curses David while he's fleeing from Absalom, right? And he's throwing stones at him and cursing him. And I thought, man, this guy got guts or he's crazy. Because David may be fleeing, but he's got his army around him, right? And Abishai, one of his commanders, is like going to King David, you want me to kill him, right? <laughs> and then this was David's response. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. And I thought, wow, he trusts God that much. He could have him killed, but he's like, you know what? No, 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 no. Maybe God ordained it. He said, look, this wrong done to me, maybe the Lord will repay me with good one day. And by the way, living by faith, living supernaturally, you know what I found is that um, sometimes, like, you need that a lot when you're suffering. So, Apostle Paul, we like to use this verse, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? And then we use that verse like, okay, like I can do anything in Christ. And I believe that's totally true. And you can use that in that context. But that verse is preceded by certain verses where Apostle Paul says, you know what? I know how to be content when I'm hungry or when I'm well-fed, okay? Some of us, if your meal is delayed by two hours, you get hangry. Whether, it says, whether in need, whether in plenty, any situation I've learned to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, last month, um, my father-in-law passed away. And I had like so much faith that God was going to heal him. Because starting a year and a half ago, God started to make me pray for certain people with cancer. And I saw a number of them get healed miraculously. Um, but obviously that wasn't the case. Sometimes I just really don't understand. But I still believe in the power of prayer. I still believe in the goodness of God. I still believe he is trustworthy. And so walking by faith sometimes, it's not just glorious, but it sometimes requires suffering. Apostle Paul said, I want to know Christ, right? Right? And fellowship with him in his sufferings. Because you know how it is. Who are your best friends in life? 
people you went through stuff with, not just people you had fun with, right? Because to him, knowing Christ was everything, and everything else was lost. And then he said that so that I may share in the riches of his glory. So it's not just like, you know, um, you know miraculous things, but it's even in everyday life. So I, I still remember, um, <laughs> this was some years back, maybe six, seven years ago, and Pastor Shine had, like, us, some of us married men, and we were sitting together, and uh, he was, you know, uh, giving us, you know, his famous seminars. And there was this one time when he was mentioning how um, that, as Apostle Peter tells us in, in, in the letter, that we need to be gentle, right, to our wives, lest the Lord, lest that your uh, prayer lives will be hindered. And as he was sharing that, he was saying, oh my gosh, you know, what if the Lord doesn't hear my prayers? What do I do, right? I could just really sense what he was saying, like, if God doesn't answer my prayer from now on, like, what is life? What do I do? How do I live for the rest of my life, right? And if I were being totally honest, I kind of looked around and saw a bunch of married men, and they're just blinking, emptily. And not to condemn, not to judge, but in my spirit, I just felt like, oh, it doesn't resonate at all because they don't pray at all. So it's like, God not listening to your prayer, it's not a big deal because you just live that way. You know why we don't pray? It's because we do not have faith. We think praying is like throwing up darts in the air. And hopefully, like, you, you hit the mark sometimes. But Jesus says that's not what prayer is. He says, you, even though you are so flawed, you know how to give gifts, gifts to your children. Because when your kids tell your mom, dad, I'm hungry, they're not throwing darts up in the air. They fully expect to be fed, and they get fed. And likewise for us. So again, is our Christian life all about, oh, yeah, I got to read the Bible more. I got to pray more. I got to do good more. I got to serve more. Or again, is it actually that when the Spirit of God enters us, we have become a totally new creation, and He has opened a completely new way of living that we need to enter into? So if we could go to the PowerPoint, please. Actually, let's go to the title page. And it says this, faith to see God's glory. Jesus said this this week to Mary, but I believe to all of us. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? If you believe, you shall see his glory. Brothers and sisters, what do you want? Do you really want to see his glory? Are you here checking in, checking out, like someone in a part-time job clocking in, clocking out? Do you really want to see God's glory in your homes, in your workplaces, in your schools, in your own life, here in our corporate gatherings? My wife is sitting here, so I mean, you know, <laughs> but I mean, that was one of the things that the Lord really convicted me of. To expect more in my home. To be the spiritual leader. Men, fathers, if you're not praying for your wife and children, who's going to do that? Your buddy? And the thing that was, the Lord was convicting me of was this. This is, again, this is spirituality. 
like all of us are going to stand before Jesus one day. So then Jesus is pressing upon my heart. I need to live a life where I would be ready to meet with him face to face. But then I chose to get married. And I chose to have kids. And so it started to press in upon me. It's not just about me. If, not, if I'm not helping my wife, better get ready for her moment when she stands before Jesus face to face. If I'm not raising my kids in a way where I'm helping them be prepared to stand before Jesus face to face, then I'm not doing my job. But I don't want to stay there. I don't want to be that. I want to see his glory. I want to see my kids be so in love with the Lord. And I'm not outsourcing that to, you know, our children's pastors. That was a one command that God gave to fathers. To raise them up in the way of the Lord. Again, I don't say this because I'm not doing a fantastic, I'm doing a fantastic job. But perhaps we can all start. And all throughout the scriptures, Jesus, when he responded with amazement, it was one of two things. It was because they had great faith or they had no faith. So then he got amazed by the faith of the centurion. And then he got amazed at the unbelief of his hometown people. When Jesus taught us to pray in Luke 18 with the parable of the widow coming to the unrighteous judge, he ends that parable by asking, when the Son of Man returns, yes, Jesus is coming back, and he said, will I find faith here on the earth? And I don't know about you, but I want to answer in the affirmative. Lord, I want, I want to make sure that when you come back, at least to whatever ability what you have given me, I want you to find faith in me. I want you to find faith here on earth. If we could go to the next slide, please. So all the people that we know in Hebrews 11, they're commended for what? Their faith. Faith, faith, and more faith. And when, here's one thing that we really need to understand better as believers, because the people of the world, they can't get this, but you are supposed to, and if you don't get this, you are missing out so much that God has given us two realms to live in, okay? The invisible and the visible. So, much so that Apostle Paul states in 2 Corinthians 4.18, we look not to the things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal, so what that's telling us that everything that is visible, they have an expiration date. Every organism dies, even inorganic stuff like this building, one day in a thousand years, two thousand years, they will crumble. But he says the invisible things are always eternal. And so we are called to fix our eyes on the invisible. And that is what faith is. Living for the invisible, not the visible. So much so that the scriptures tell us that the visible things are only shadows of the invisible. These are the real stuff, the invisible, and the visible stuff are mere shadows of it. That's why Moses built the tabernacle, it says, according to the, what it looked like in heaven. Let's go to the next slide. And it says this, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Brothers and sisters, you know it's not your obligation, but it is your privilege to be here to worship the Lord. You know why? Because the only people who are able to worship God are people who have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb and the Spirit of God lives inside of them. So if you're not a believer, we welcome you. We pray and hope that you will come to believe in Jesus, but you're honestly just not really able to worship because God is spirit, and those of us who worship, worship him in spirit and in truth. 
And so, so in John 6, 63, it says, it is a spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. Likewise, you may be standing here, sitting there and thinking, okay, this guy is talking. But again, if we have eyes to see, right? And when Jesus says that it was never about physical eyes, it was always about spiritual eyes. He says, no, these words are spirit and life. So we can't know God by our intellect. We can't grasp the God of the universe. You come to know him by faith. If we go to the next slide, it tells us this, okay? And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truth to those who are spiritual. The natural person who do not have the Spirit, they do not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So only those who have the Spirit of God can enter into the dimension of the invisible world, and that invisible world, how do you see? The <laughs> faith is the only way. It is a key that opens and unlocks the door to the invisible world. Obviously, because your five senses aren't going to do it. Okay? So let's go to the next slide. I've been going through a Bible study with uh, our college students from the book of Ephesians. And it says this over and over again. Heavenly places. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And you know how a lot of people in the church respond to that verse? It's like, oh, that's great. You know? I guess when I die, I can, you know, just access. No, 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 no. By the way, those places, that word places does not actually indicate location. It's really talking about realm. Okay? So then he's saying, we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Because we're in Christ, and he does not withhold anything. In heavenly places, and he say, actually, we are to access that and live it out here on earth. That was the Lord's prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he tells us a reality in Ephesians 2, 6. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, the church is supposed to manifest this, right? The church is not some weak people, okay? Jesus says the gates of hell will not overcome it. And it is a church who displays the manifold wisdom of God might now be known, made to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This is talking about, obviously, demonic realm, right? It's not talking about rulers, you know, here on earth. And then Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's where our battle lies. This is a standard Christian life. But you know, sometimes when I reflect upon myself and I want to hear the prayers of people in the church, I feel like our focus is always on the earthly, the visible. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for some of these things. I'm not saying that. But then when all of our focus becomes on earthly stuff, then like Apostle Paul, you know, rebukes the church. He says, you're not spiritual. You're earthly. He was telling the believers who are quarreling. Because he says he says to the church, Right? In 1 Timothy 5, 1, he says, Treat older men as your fathers, older women as your mothers, younger brothers, young, younger men as brothers, and younger sisters, younger women as sisters with absolute purity. And we might think, oh, that's like a nice ideal. No, no, no. It's actually understood with eyes of faith. Really. Because in God's eternal kingdom, our relationships are meant to be eternal. And we're really brothers. We're really sisters. Forever, because we have one Father. It's nothing less than our bond with our earthly brothers and sisters. I mean, it may be for you in your life right now, but that's actually not the reality, eternal reality, and we need to be awakened to that. So then when I look at the prayers of Apostle Paul for the church that are recorded in the Scriptures, 
And I believe that one of the ways to really ignite our prayer lives is to pray the prayers in the scriptures. So in the book of Ephesians, there's two main prayers in the second half of chapter 1 and the second half of chapter 3. And Apostle Paul prays this. In chapter 3, he says, I pray for you, right? That through the power of the Holy Spirit and together with all the saints, that you would know a love that is unknowable. Talking about, talk about an oxymoron. Know something that is beyond some understanding. To know how deep and how high, how wide and, and long the love of God is. He's like, that's my prayer for you. And in Ephesians 1, he says, I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Christ better. And that I pray that God will open the eyes of your hearts, right? Not physical eyes, but spiritual eyes, so that you would know the hope to which you have been called, the riches, the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints, and the incomparably great power to us who believe. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead who lives inside of us. That's not something you can grasp with a nice little Bible study, right? And, oh, yeah, cool, cool, and your head said, no. They are spiritual things understood spiritually, which is why Apostle Paul prays for the spirit of wisdom and revelation, prays for the awakening of the hearts, the eyes of their hearts. Can you imagine what your life and my life would look like if we would come to comprehend the hope to which you and I have been called, the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints, where God really tells you that he has an inheritance prepared for you that is eternal. And earlier on in Ephesians 1, it says, and he has sealed that, and it's a guarantee if you have the Holy Spirit. There's something Pastor Han always says. He says, prayer is an investment into your future. More than your 401ks, more than your stocks and bonds. I can't help but remember. When my son was born, before he was 24 hours old, Pastor Shine came to the hospital room And as he was praying for my son, I was overwhelmed with tears because it dawned on me, because I didn't grow up in a Christian home, I prayed for my parents before they ever prayed for me. That here is this kid who is so blessed that before he's even a day old, he gets to be prayed for. I pray for him every night because it's an investment into the future. Sometimes our earthly orientation is a problem. I'm not saying not to pray for those things, but sometimes when we hear people, honestly, your prayer requests sound the same when you were a high school kid, you know? Always praying about your circumstances, oh, low, you know, and you need inner, inner healing, you know, for the rest of your life. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, you know, be sarcastic. Because in this world, you always have problems. Always praying about our circumstances. Again, I'm not denouncing that, but then I just see the prayers in the scriptures, and maybe it's time for us to awaken to that. Maybe what is more important than some circumstance being fixed is actually that you and I would come to know the love of God that is unknowable through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because brothers and sisters, your circumstances do not give us peace. God does. He is our peace. And we know if we're earthly or spiritual based on how we respond to our circumstances, We're either swayed by our circumstances left and right, or we start to respond to what our spirit tells us in spite of our circumstances. So faith is a key to opening that invisible world, and we are called to live in a new dimension 
that the Spirit of God does not dwell inside you and me so that we could just try a little bit harder and live a little bit better than the other people. It's like, no, 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 Jesus is calling us to something amazing. Let's go to the next slide. For we walk by faith, not by sight. All things are possible for one who believes. Brothers and sisters, do we believe that? I pray for myself that I will see that verse in reality because those words are living and active. They're not there. I, I, I got to see that. I got to experience that in my life, you know? How about us? Let's go to the next slide. And faith, okay? It's this simple, right? Jesus is talking to these people who are arguing with him, and they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is a work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? So this is our work, to believe in him. Of course, it's not just head knowledge. It has every ramification to do with our daily life, but that is all we are called. Faith, okay, is foundational to living a spiritual life, okay? Everything in the spiritual realm, in the invisible realm, is hinged on faith. I remember Pastor Kim, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, saying, hey, if you can see it, there's no need for faith, right? And he used kind of a weird illustration, honestly. He's like, if you think your fist is an apple, okay? <laughs> if you think your fist is a fist, that's, that's not faith. But if you think your fist is going to turn into an apple, you believe it's an apple, okay? It is. I remember going, what in the world, apple? I, I just want it to be my hand. <laughs> But then he, I still remember, there was a verse he said, right? This is the principle of prayer, he said, from the scriptures. Believe that you have received it and it will be given to you. And I thought, that was life-shattering for me. What? Okay. I, I read that before. It just never dawned on me. It's like, oh, yeah. Believe that you already have it. And you'll see, like your faith declares, your, you can see with faith, <laughs> you know, you see it. It's reality. And that's what it tells about the people in Hebrews 11, right? They did not receive the things, but they saw it from a distance, and they were commended for their faith. But praise be to God, some of the very things that we have in faith, we see it in our lives. We see it. God gives us a pleasure. One of the things that God has pressed somebody to pray for over some years is to pray for the reunification of Korea, North Korea. I believe I'll see it. God, I tell God, God, give me the satisfaction of seeing that with my own eyes. You know? I mean, if you look at that government, it's hard to really believe that because you got this guy who's a dictator and, and the people are brainwashed, but it's just like, well, God is so great. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Kim Jong-un has nothing on him, right? Faith to believe. Because one of the things that the Lord was revealing to me as he was pressing me to keep praying in faith was that back when Korea was under Japanese rule, right, for 35 years, Japan was, I mean, the superpower of Asia, right? Just like Germany was ransacking Europe, Japan was just having its way through Korea, China, and every part of Asia. And he was reminding me that there were freedom fighters and believers, Korean-American Christians, who are praying for the liberation of Korea, and in their physical eyes, how could you believe that could happen when Japan was absolutely dominating that world, but God was reminding me, well, he answered those prayers, and so I should have faith that God will liberate North Korea too. Eyes to see, Jesus said, Blessed are you, he told the disciples, because you have eyes to see and ears to hear. And he was obviously not talking about this or that. It was spiritual. Eyes to see North Korea being liberated. Eyes to see God bring about a greater revival in North Korea than he did in Pyongyang back in 1907. Eyes to see God bring a greater revival here in Los Angeles than he did back in 1906 in Azusa Street. Eyes to see.
Let's go to the next slide. And sometimes we struggle with faith, and believe me, I preach this to myself. I'm not an incredible man of prayer. I always tell people, like, you, my preaching is honestly me talking to me, myself, and then you get to listen in. Unbelief is not a small deal. Yes, we all struggle with it. I get it. We're all weak. But here's what Jesus had to say. In the scriptures, a lot of times, the word wicked is coupled with two other words, lazy, spiritual laziness, because again, that comes when you don't have faith, and wicked and unbelieving. He comments, what shall I do with this wicked and unbelieving generation? He says, take care, brothers. Okay? It's not just another Bible verse. Take care, my brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Evil and unbelieving. Okay? Unbelief is a foundational sin because we know that the devil is a father of lies and in the Garden of Eden, serpent deceived Adam and Eve, right? And said, surely you will not die. And when they chose to not only fall for that, but they were filled with unbelief as to what God told them, that they would die, then that started what happened. So the problem, why unbelief is such a big deal, and not just you struggling through it, is because unbelief declares that God is a liar. And unbelief declares that you know better than God does, so then you're going to do your way. See? See? Faith wouldn't be needed if we understand everything, right? It wouldn't be needed, right? Faith is required when we, only when we cannot see. Faith is required when we only we cannot understand. I don't understand when, why the Lord took my father-in-law last month. But God did give us a great reassurance, telling us that he was with him. That's all I need. God is good all the time. And even in the midst of our sufferings and things that we don't understand, man, I found faith having eyes to see. Oh my gosh, I don't know how people in the world live. I really don't. Let's go to the next slide. That's why Tom is the one who had to feel Jesus' scars. This was the interaction. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God, after feeling it. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's important to the Lord. God commands. Because faith is, I mean, sometimes we, I like to use the word trust to replace it. Because then it's a living, it's a relational term. Trusting in God. The way David trusted God, even when Shimei was throwing rocks at him. Even though he could have had that guy killed in that moment. Right? That was always a condition for Jesus performing the miraculous. He said, if you believe. He always told the people, according to your faith, it will be done to you. Brothers and sisters, what is the faith that we are experiencing? Right? And just like Jesus told Mary, I believe he is speaking that to us today. If you believe, you will see my glory. Do we have faith to see his glory? Brothers and sisters, don't we want to see God's glory in our homes? Don't we want to see God's glory in our workplaces? Hey, please, of course, live as salt and light. But you know, just because you're nice to your coworkers doesn't mean they come to know Jesus. Let's open our mouths in faith. God has not given you a spirit of timidity but of power and love and self-control. Again, tell yourself, okay, his living reality, not what your emotions tell you in that moment. Let's have eyes of faith. Don't we want? No, I, I, I mean, you know, this could backfire big time because whatever, but, you know, I'm hoping to go to Korea. My parents live there, so that's a big part of it, but there's this part of me, and I'm trapping myself because I'm declaring it, so I must do this, right? so that I don't come back here in, uh, in shame. But, like, I'm motivated because two of my aunts 
uh, or they've been in a cult all their lives. And there's no earthly eye that I can see with in how they would ever come to believe in Jesus. But I'm praying because God is greater. So that's actually my biggest motivation. Because, you know, heaven and hell is not just like something, like it's, it's real. That's why we need to be spiritually awake. That's why we need to have faith. So I just choose to believe. God, you said, if I believe, I will see your glory. So, I got to see it. Let's go to the next slide. And I'll close with these two slides. It says this, now faith is assurance. Some Bible translations have the word reality of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Some translations have the word evidence of things not seen. So instead of complicating what this verse means, I just learned to be like a stupid kid, just take it at face value. Oh, okay. My faith is the real, I mean, it just, it's the proof that this is real. When we talk about the presence of God, it's not like because you play a slow praise song that you feel like, whether you feel it, whether you see it or not, the reality of God's presence here in this place does not change because you don't perceive it. It's as real. It's actually more real than you being here. And I believe you are here. It's not just some kind of like a, you know, like a fleeting thing. It's so real. And my faith says so. But the evidence of things not seen, you see why this is not something that unbelievers can access? It's a totally new dimension of living where your faith becomes your sixth sense, and it's a, in, it's a key into the invisible world where you have been blessed and you have been seated in the heavenly places, and there have, you have been blessed with everything in Christ. And your battle stops becoming about your circumstances and flesh and blood, but it becomes, it becomes about the spiritual realities. For by it, what's it? Faith. The people of old receive their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe is created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Again, the invisible is actually the greater reality. It birthed the visible. And without faith, it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. Let's go to the next slide. It'll be my last slide. And by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, okay, unseen, In reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. I was talking to a a friend yesterday who um, is in the ministry uh, but he wasn't as fortunate as me, and he bounced around from church to church and kind of dealt with a lot of dysfunction. And he asked me, how in the world are you at the same church for 15 years? You know, and I told him, because oh, all the pay and the benefits is awesome, you know? <laughs> I said, it just really comes down to two things. I said, I believe in the mission of my church. And I absolutely believe in the senior leaders of this church. Starting with that man of faith, and Pastor Han, and Pastor Shine, who is not a typical EM pastor, but who I am absolutely certain is the one who's supposed to be here because they're men of faith. To me, it's not that hard. It's easy. I mean, of course, there's deep affection for, you know, the people. Um, That's a big reason, too, but 
I think without the first two, I'm not sure that that's going to keep things, you know? And as it shows in that passage, faith, um, the essence of our faith is obedience. That proves what you really believe, you know, not what you say. And God will test your faith, people. Man, Abraham took Isaac up Mount Moriah. Our faith must be proven real. It comes out, you know? It comes out as something tangible. It's not just something that we just hold bottle up inside of us. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes this is hard, okay? But let me tell you, if your faith is abstract, then your prayers will become abstract and the answers to your prayers will become abstract too. But if your faith is real, your prayers start to become really real and the answers become very real and tangible too. Apple, you know? I could ask the praise him to come up, please. Brothers and sisters, those of us who are really struggling, I don't want to make light of that at all. I'm just a man, you know, I know, I know, I know you. I feel you, okay? But for those of us who are condemning ourselves, look, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's nothing partial about Jesus' salvation. Please, have more faith in the power of his blood than your own sins. Brothers and sisters, those of us who feel inadequate, who feel like they can't do, oh, oh that's great, but like, you know, 90% of the people like receive this, but like I'm the 10% who disqualify. Look, stop looking at yourself. When God called Moses and he said, oh, that's a problem, you know, who am I to go to Pharaoh, the most powerful person in the world? You want me to, get, you know, get my head chopped off? No, you be my spokesperson. It's like, God, I stutter. I can't. God simply say, who made your mouth? And sometimes when we go through difficulties and challenges, I don't dismiss that. And you can pray regarding that. But sometimes those are opportunities for our faith to be proven. Some of us lose those moments through our complaints and blaming and discouragement. And let me boil it down to very practical things as I conclude. We don't live in an obese society, unhealthy society, because we don't know how to be physically healthy in America, right? Everyone knows. It's very simple. You eat right, exercise, and sleep, and I don't know if there's a fourth, but we all know, like, it's not a matter of not knowing. Everyone, your eight-year-old kid can tell you, but it's a matter of doing, right? Remember when you were younger and you tricked yourself into thinking, like, when you were a high school kid, oh, yeah, when I get older, I'll read the scriptures and I'll, I'll get a prayer life, and right now I have to do the right thing, you know, which is focus on my SATs, you know? And then you tricked yourself, and now you're 40 and you still don't do those things. It's a problem. It's time for us, like, <laughs> let's start. I'm not here to condemn. Let's start. Husbands and fathers, let's start. Because the Lord will receive us. And all you need is a faith as small as a mustard seed. That's all it's required. So are we going to live with our five senses like the rest of the world? Or are we going to live with the Spirit of God guiding us, leading us into the invisible world, which is not simply invisible, but it's the eternal world. And living in that dimension where it starts to become reality that Nothing is impossible for those who believe. Is that the life that we want? So if I may humbly ask all of us, if we could rise together. And let's pray. For some of us, I'm going to give us permission to pray over our circumstances. 
Some of us, let's repent of our unbelief. Today, get rid of that. And right now, we're not doing it because it's the next thing in the program, but like, let's believe right now. You're not throwing some darts up in the air. Your prayer right now matters. It's real, and it's going to be answered. So let's repent of any of our unbelief, and let's say, God, I want to see your glory here. I want to see your glory there. Give me eyes to see, the eyes of my heart. Give me ears to hear. Let him who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Let us be such people. And I really pray, as I shared, prayed before we started, that you and I are going to start to see that 30, 60, 100 fold, and it's going to be glorious in our lives. So can we take this time to come before the Lord repenting of any areas of unbelief, any areas where we declare God a liar in our lives. And we say, yes, Lord, we believe. So help me. Let me see your glory here. Let me see your glory there. I want to see. I believe, Lord Jesus. Can we pray that together? Let's call upon the name of Jesus together. Let's pray like we mean it. Let's engage the Lord at this time. One, two, three. Jesus! 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 Father God, we come before you, Lord God.